Hello again everyone, hope you're all doing well and thank you for joining us for another video. Now, this might not be a surprise for you to hear, but I'm personally not a fan of people who misrepresent information to try and validate their claims. And I'm even less of a fan when it's my information that's being misrepresented. But that is the approach that the Apollo detectives seem to insist on taking, judging by their recent video, which included a clip of footage of me with an overlay of a parrot on my shoulder. Because I'm a pirate? Anyway, this isn't the first run-in I've had with the Apollo deceptives, as I've come to call them. I've addressed some of their deceptions in a previous video, which I will link up here. Yeah, I looked this morning and Dave McKeegan took down that video that he did on us. Whoa. Have I? Let me check. Oh no, there it is. I'm sure I saw that thumbnail somewhere a second ago. Yeah, I looked this morning and Dave McKeegan took down that video that he did on us. The main one of this for me was a part of an email I'd received from their member Scott Henderson, where he'd attached photos of some film and claimed it was an experiment done by the Glenn Research Center in a vacuum chamber to test the effects of a vacuum on a film and that it proved film wouldn't be able to survive in space. When in reality, the pictures he'd included were from an entirely different experiment done with materials that had been left outside the International Space Station for over a year to test the effects of radiation, and there is no record of the experiment that Scott claimed the images were from. Scott's response to this in one of their later videos was that the images were from his claimed experiment and that they only look similar to the International Space Station experiment. The original we had up there on the Aula site that was taken down, that picture of those materials that were outgassing, that was the ones that Joyce Deaver did. That was not the one on the space station. Right, and you can even see the angle on it. They're a similar product, but the difference in the angle and what was posted in her PDF file is the one I snapped out of there. Right. So... They're claiming that their image isn't this one here that's listed on the Glenn Research Center's website as part of the Missy 5 experiment. And incidentally, here is the Missy 5 experiment on the outside of the International Space Station. And the reason that we can't find this original experiment in the vacuum chamber is because the day after they'd found the paper, the paper was removed and then later republished with major edits to hide what they discovered. Right after we posted the article on Aulis with the links to the Joyce Deaver's PDF files on the documents, they were immediately removed. And all of Joyce Deaver's 56 PDF files over her 1991 to 2005 experiments at the Glenn Research Center, you can now buy them. And of course, they're going to give you a redacted version. It doesn't matter what you put in there. You're going to be very careful that the original documents are no longer going to be available. That's right, apparently a multi-billion dollar space agency has two conspiracy theorists of a small YouTube channel under 24 hour constant surveillance and if they happen to find something in documents which are publicly available to everyone, then they remove them and edit them. Crazy how Scott was able to grab screenshots of the images from the research paper, but never thought to screenshot the rest of the paper or download it. Apparently, this isn't even the first time it's happened. You'd have thought they'd have learnt by now. Anyway, those deceptions had come from him misrepresenting information that was in private emails between the two of us. His latest one manages to misrepresent information that I'd put in their own comment section for all to see. Now, in order to get some context of what they're about to claim, let's first take a quick dive into the Apollo spacecrafts themselves. All Apollo moon missions were launched on the infamous Saturn V rocket, which consisted of multiple stages. There was the S1C, the first stage at the bottom, on top of which sat the S2 second stage, followed by the S4B third stage, inside which was the lunar module that would actually land on the moon, then the command service module, and lastly, the launch escape system at the top. 
Now, the first and second stage and the launch escape system were all dispensed with in the process of reaching Earth orbit. The S-4B engine would then be used to perform a TLI, or translunar injection burn, which pushed the spacecraft's orbit out to reach the moon. After the TLI was done, the crew would perform a procedure called transposition and docking, in which the command service module would detach from the S-4B, turn around, and then connect to the lunar module. These two craft would then detach from the S-4B and continue on a three-day trip to the moon. So, all of this with the Apollo detectives began because I'd made a reference in my last video where I talked about the crafts being put into a slow roll in order to balance out where the sunlight was shining on them. This was a procedure called PTC, or Passive Thermal Control, because it was done to control the thermals of the spacecraft without having any active heating or cooling running, so it was done passively. Now this wasn't done continuously for three days, it was done intermittently throughout the time period. It was also referred to as a barbecue roll because it essentially mimicked the effects of a barbecue rotisserie. Now the CSM as it was known consisted of the command module which housed the crew and then the service module which contained the SPS engine, the fuel for it, as well as hydrogen and oxygen tanks to provide power and life support to the command module. For Apollos 15, 16, and 17, they also had a SIM bay, or scientific instrument module, installed into the service module. This included several pieces of equipment for taking scientific measurements whilst in orbit, including cameras to photograph the lunar surface. Because up to that point, all of the photos from orbit had to be done with the Hasselblad cameras that were inside the spacecraft and done shooting through windows. So the Apollo detectives then made the following claims about the mapping camera's usage. But they could have it in barbecue mode if it's the mapping camera on the moon. Can't be in barbecue mode. Camera has to point straight at the moon, so it's no longer in barbecue mode. Now, the PTC roll was stopped once they'd reached lunar orbit. Yes, to Apollo 11, the next time we pass through roll zero, we're going to stop PTC, and that'll give us a 90 degrees pitch. Now, I understand you want us to move from 90 degrees pitch to zero degrees pitch for the platform align, uh, option one. Is that a primitive? Firstly, you'd want the crafts to be stable before undocking, and the lunar module crew don't want to have to immediately start wasting fuel trying to stop a roll and then orientate themselves. Secondly, the PTC was needed on the way to the moon because the crafts were fixed in sunlight for three days non-stop. Whereas around the moon, the CSM took roughly two hours to complete an orbit, meaning the craft went through approximately one hour cycles of going from sunlight and shadow, which would automatically serve as a passive thermal control. Secondly, they claimed the cameras in the Simbe were exposed throughout the launch and through the Van Allen belts, which would have destroyed the film. And then you realize that the film is outside of this craft the entire length of time. Out on the outside of the mapping camera and everything that was on the outside of the CSM. It went through from launch, through the atmospheric pressure changes, through the Van Allen belt, through the extreme vacuum. Except you can see, comparing this photo of Apollo 15 in lunar orbit with the Simbe exposed, to this photo of the Apollo 15's launch, the Simbay is clearly located under this panel. All of this I explained to Scott in the comments section, to which his response was to try doubling down on the Simbay being exposed during launch, and then trying to say that it was inside the S4B stage. Well, if it's inside the S4B, it would mean it was covered up, not exposed. But you can see from the strips around the bottom of the service module that the S4B only came up to the base of the CSM, not over it. So the Simbay was not exposed during launch. The cover over it remained in place until about 76 hours into the flight, when radio transcripts show that the panel was ejected from inside the command module whilst in orbit around the moon. As for their points about the film surviving getting back to Earth, only the command module actually returned safely to Earth. The service module was jettisoned a few hours before re-entering the atmosphere, as the command module was the only part of the Saturn V that had the heat shield that was necessary to protect it against the heat of re-entry. So one of the crew, usually the command module pilot, would conduct an EVA, or a spacewalk. 
All astronauts in the craft would don their full spacesuits, they would depressurize the command module, and then one of the crew would go out whilst on a tether, travel back to the sim bay, and retrieve the film magazines from the cameras, and then bring it back into the command module. So the film was safely in the command module before re-entry. Such EVAs had been done previously. Numerous spacewalks had taken place during Gemini flight, and Apollo 9 conducted an EVA to test their ability to be able to move from the command module to the lunar module were there to ever be a problem with the interior tunnel. On day 11 of Apollo 15's mission, command module pilot Al Warden conducted the first ever spacewalk that was beyond low Earth orbit. The entire transcript of this, along with video footage, all available to see online. You ready, Jim? I'll work my way down. Okay, it's reading four. A point I raised with Scott by including a quote from the radio transcript from Warden stating he'd made an extra trip to the Simbe to check the mapping camera. Points which Scott clearly took note of as he'd responded to the comments by trying to divert the subject. Now, this conversation was months ago, and Scott had then fallen silent, so I figured, case closed. However, a few days ago, the Apollo detectives reignited this issue, with Scott electing to show a different quote that I'd given from a completely different comment. One in which the lunar module pilot of one of the missions had stated about after translunar injection that he needed to go down into the sim bay. He was told to wait until after the transposition and docking with the lunar module was done, and ultimately I don't believe the early EVA actually took place. I merely used the quote to highlight that they talked in the missions about accessing the Simbay themselves. However, I don't believe the Apollo detectives liked that explanation, so instead they decided to throw a spin on it. He claims he's quoting one of the astronauts, the LMP, I've got to get down to the Simbay. Well... You are in the command module. The heat shield is between you and the other part of your capsule that you're in there, right? The sim bay is on the outside. You can't access it from the inside. I didn't go and look this up because there's no way this is in the transcript. I mean, this is confirmation bias at its finest. Ignore all evidence of EVAs being done to retrieve the camera film. Then, despite being given the exact times within the transcripts to verify all of this, instead openly admit you haven't bothered to look at any of it, and then focus on the use of the word down to create a story that I'm trying to suggest they travel through the floor of the command module. Even questioning how did they manage to do it without an EVA. Just ask Dave how he would do that. How the lunar module pilot would get from the command module into the service module. The funniest part of all of this is their original argument was how did they ever manage to get the film from the mapping camera? Then in the comments after I'd pointed out it was done by an EVA, trying to argue that no, no EVA had taken place. Then a future video they're then trying to suggest that I hadn't claimed that they'd done an EVA and was trying to argue that an EVA would have had to have been done to get the film back. All the while, on multiple occasions in different parts of their videos, they've actually used footage of the EVAs taking place. This is detective work at its finest. Ironic that they repeatedly claim to be seeking the truth and accuse me of having confirmation bias and then manage to pull moves like this with comments that are right there for all to see. I even called them up on the matter by highlighting I'd already explained the EVAs to Scott in the comments. Now, I did make an error here. I was made aware that this latest video talked about me after one of my regular viewers had contacted me about it and said they couldn't find the, my comments that they were referring to. I went to look for them myself. I couldn't see them either, which led me to believe that they'd removed my comments to try and hide the fact that they were misrepresenting them. A claim that they denied, and I later actually found the conversations, but they'd been a part of replies to someone else's original comment, which is how I'd managed to miss them. A mistake that I acknowledged and apologised to them for. Dave thinks that we don't know anything or haven't studied any of the documentation on this. Okay. He's just trying to pull this one over. He needs to go back to his digital photography 
and he needs to stop playing around with this because there's no way he'll ever catch up to us. Now this is where I can't decide if things are funny or alarming. I know full well those two have spent a lot of time looking through Apollo documentation, so I know there's not a chance in hell they've managed to miss all the information about those EVAs taking place. Now, maybe, given the fact that our exchange was two months ago, maybe Scott genuinely forgot the conversation that we'd had about me explaining the EVA, and only happened to remember one particular comment from a different conversation. But you'd have thought, after being called out by it openly in the comment section, any decent person with some integrity might acknowledge their mistake. I mean, any devious person with some common sense might just ignore the comment and have said nothing. Their approach, however, was to confirm that my comments hadn't been removed and instead just try to push their little dig about the parrot. So either they haven't actually managed to work out that they've been lying about our conversations or they know full well that they're lying about it and don't care who knows it. Either way, I'm sure they won't mind me making this video about them since apparently they're so keen for the truth about things to be made so public. So that is going to wrap this video up. As always, if you have anything to add to the discussion, please feel free to leave it in the comments down below. While you're down there, if you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, or you can help support the channel further by signing up to my Patreon account, and then hopefully we'll see you in the next video.